Hi. I'm Matthew Hoskin, and you've been following my YouTube channel if you're watching this probably, and I thought I would just make a little quick video tonight just to let you know that I'm planning on making some sort of grand YouTube debut and return. Um, I've been off the tube for a while and hoping to be back now um, for a bit while, while longer. And one of the things I've decided to do to give myself impetus, direction, and make things work more frequently is that I'm going to actually turn my YouTube channel into a new podcast. It's going to give a little bit more focus. It's going to be chapters in the history of Christian spirituality. It's going to go like vaguely chronological, but not entirely because I have prerogative as the podcaster. So that's a sort of thing to come up with. So my YouTube channel will turn into both these solo videos of me as well as ongoing uh, sporadic podcasting with my brother as we try to get that one sorted out as well. Don't worry, Devotion to Christ isn't gone forever. We hope to be back to regular podcasting soon. So, but before I get going with that new idea with the chapters in the history of Christian spirituality, I actually want to talk to you about St. Augustine of Hippo. Why? Why St. Augustine of Hippo? And really, this is a really good question coming from someone like me, because I consciously chose when I went to go do my PhD, not to do St. Augustine of Hippo. I said, you know what? So many people do Augustine all the time. I'm not interested in being one of them. There are so many other really interesting, less studied figures from late antiquity who aren't Augustine. And so I did not study Augustine of Hippo. And really, there's just so much Augustine. I think the guys who are true Augustine guys find themselves doing pretty much almost nothing but Augustine, really. Like, you go to the Oxford Patristics Conference, and there is one room, to, there is one paper about Augustine at any given moment. I'm not joking. There's, in fact, like an entire room for just Augustine, let alone maybe some other Augustine papers scattered around. So, but Augustine, as it turns out, is actually really important, and I've been teaching Augustine recently. So I actually thought maybe I'd make a little toot video for you there for talking a bit about what I've been teaching from Augustine, what I will be teaching about Augustine, and why maybe you should get to know St. Augustine the Hippo. I mean, <clears throat> St. Augustine, Bishop of, Hippo, Bishop of Hippo, Regius, yourself. As I said, I just finished teaching a course on Augustine. It was a course on City of God. City of God, as you may know, is gigantic. It is huge. It is not Augustine's largest work. That is his Enerationes in Salmos. But it's still big. It was the only reading I assigned. Students just, I chopped it up into vaguely readable chunks for them to get through, so that by the end of week 10, they will have heard 10 lectures, had 10 discussions, and read all 22 books of City of God. And it's just so massive. And it's also a really important book. It is an influential book in the history of Christian thought, and it continues to exert an influence on people in a variety of ways. Today, a lot of the time, I think its greatest influence is found in the realm of political theology, uh, such as my uh, friend and colleague James Wood um, does work on political theology, and I know he is preparing a course at Redeemer University where he will be teaching Augustine's City of God to his students as well. So it's really important for that, and that's probably today, if you're like, ah, oh, City of God, yes. Probably mostly you're going to hear about it in terms of political theology. Maybe, just maybe, you might hear about it in terms of just war theory as well, which sort of ties into political theology. And that's sort of part of this whole narrative that some people like to sort of promote and tout about, that after Constantine, everything went terrible. Before Constantine, Christians were a bunch of, like, I don't know, hippies, who pacifists who sort of ran around living in accordance with nature and not killing people and stuff like that. And then after Constantine, everything turned around and they became a bunch of bloodthirsty killers. And so it was up to the tainted, horrible Bishop of Hippo to come up with a theology to justify the terrible situation. This is, I mean, obviously I'm caricaturing a caricature. That's a straw man. So obviously I've just offended a whole bunch of people on YouTube who are now going to come into the comments. But it's also the case that that is not uh, really what happened. And there are articles out there for those who have eyes to read, they can read. And it is also the case that Augustine's just war theory exists as one small sliver of what's going on in City of God. And he would say no war is better. Right? That peace is what everyone wants. But that there are certain circumstances under which war ends up being waged. 
as part of our earthly existence. But one of the really interesting things, if you want to be reading City of God with your eyes open, you're reading it as a work of Christian theology, is that he says, but you know what? You might lose. You could lose an earthly war. He doesn't like say this explicitly, like, but he could, he, could, he could even say the whole Roman Empire could be completely wiped out. Which, as we know, at this end of history, that happened. <clears throat> the city of God will prevail. Right? That's the point. He does not imagine the Roman Empire's being contiguous with the city of God. That is one of the main things. So whatever he has to say about how the ideal Christian ruler and what are the best ways for Christian rulers to live, th that, and therefore just war, is only one piece of a much bigger puzzle, and he has a much, um, he has a very high view of the city of God and the body of Christ, the totus Christus, and all of these things working together throughout the book. So that's just worth saying right there. So it's an important book for that also. It's an important book for apologetics. Um, there's a recent book that came out, the name of which escapes me, but there's an article in Ad Fontes um, based on an excerpt out of the book. And basically the argument is that you know, look, this is meant to be a work of apologetics, which it is, right? It is, in theory, one of the goals of Augustine's book on the city of God against the pagans is to convince the pagans, those Greeks and Romans who do not follow Christian teaching, who are not disciples of Jesus Christ, that actually Roman religion is false, and they should throw in their lot with Jesus and become citizens of the city of God. Right? This is one of the things he's doing. And so he goes about doing that sort of by showing this, it's, this is a standard ancient Christian move, actually. He shows how the Christians themselves, in fact, are better at being what pagans think is good and that and alongside it also shows like the vapidity of pagan theology um, whether it's the stuff you see in the theater or read in the epics or the sort of stuff you see being performed at a temple with the slaughter of animals or the things that you read about in the neo neoplatonists who are the closest well he calls them platonists they are the closest to come to the truth about god he shows ultimately it is vacuous and that it is only the truth of the Christian gospel and the God who became man to save us that can bring us to the everlasting kingdom of God and eternal life and life itself. So it's apologetics. Also, I'm not going to go into all of these things in detail, but it also deals in moral theology. It deals in Christology. It also shows us about how to interpret sacred scripture. And yes, also, this is one of the things the very first time I read it that struck me. It is also a work of the theology of history, which, since I once upon a time was a master's student sitting in a seminar with a fellow student who declared that the, I'm not joking, fall of Constantinople in 1453 was in fact God's judgment on them for the iconoclastic controversy of the 8th and 9th centuries. I guess God's judgment was delayed. Well, Augustine is here to tell you, you can't actually do that. That God is the Lord of history, and that all things do work out according to his providence. And they everything works together for the good of God's great and glorious plan for the universe, that Melkor's discordant notes in the music of creation will not prevail, and that only the true song of Iluvatar Oh, no, wait, that's Tolkien. Oh, no, it still works, though. It's the same basic idea. Um, and so when you look at history, though, there's not actually this one-to-one -one, good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. It doesn't happen. If you're a pagan, bad things happen to pagans. If bad things happen to devout pagans. If you're a Christian, bad things happen to good Christians. They Bad things happen to good Christians. Like, it's just good and bad do not actually have this sort of transactional thing. The secret is not true. Bad things happen to, quote, good people. And Augustine goes into um, why this might be, and he talks about, he points out that, you know, the sack of Rome actually um, was mitigated by Christianity, not caused by it, which is what the pagans were trying to argue. So he gets into the theology of history and how 
one of the takeaways of this, one that has been a hard lesson for people to learn, is that we cannot be certain that any single worldly disaster is 100% definitely God's judgment upon sin. People like to do that. For example, in 1066, according to one of the versions of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the French were God's judgment upon the English. And they have been ever since. Just kidding, I like French people. Anyway, so that's a really cool thing that I really like in City of God. So I've just sort of finished teaching that a couple weeks ago, and it's sort of still on my mind. And I'm coming up on another Augustine course. So you can already see City of God important. Lots of big ideas are going on in it. Well, I'm coming up, I'm going to be teaching Augustine the Preacher this autumn. Hoping to get lots of people to come into that. I think it's really important that we're going to be looking, looking at Augustine's book on Christian teaching, or De Doctrina Christiana, and we're going to be looking at some of his sermons on the Psalms. So we've got the essential expositions of the Psalms. Um, this translation, actually, the full one takes six volumes. So it's his biggest book. We're not doing, we're not even doing this whole thing because it's only one course. And I want to get a bunch of other sermons in. So we're going to be looking at some of his gospel homilies as well. The Sermon on the Mount, Gospel of John, all these sorts of things. <clears throat> sort of with and with the goal of seeing both how do you interpret sacred scripture, right? There are these uh, thing, important things that we read in De Doctrina that I really want to, to bring out to students. Um, this will be my second time teaching that book and I love it. It's a good book. He sort of invents semiotics along the way, so that's cool. Um, the signum et race and all these sorts of things, the sign and the, the thing. So that's sort of, that's, that's a big part of it, but also sort of how do you draw out the senses of scripture? How do we see Augustine doing this? How do we see him operating as an exegete? But then there's more to it than just that, right? So we see him exegeting scripture, but we also see him teaching theology to his congregation. Augustine is a theologian. And so how do you do theological preaching and expository preaching? But also, although Augustine, if you read Confessions, you know that Augustine is sort of like by the time he's, you know, a full-on Christian professional, professional Christian, he sort of poo-poos, not poo-poos, but he's not, he's no longer trying to do all the tricks of eloquence that he was doing when he was a professional orator. But that training is still there. And I would argue that that training still informs the way that he preaches and the way he chooses. He just is no longer choosing those same versions of eloquence. I have suspicions that he probably would have been floored, but that's just because that's what people liked in fanciness. Whereas he consciously chooses to use his training to, prop, to be, I would say he's probably more of the middle style, Ciceronian. Um, <clears throat> So that's just that. So I'm probably, you know, with my background in classics and the Cicero that I've read, both the speeches as well as the De Oratore and the Orator and the bits of Quintilian that I've dealt with, I'm going to have lots to say. It's going to be great. It's going to be amazing because Augustine is a super important preacher um, as well for history and his sermons get read and reread and used. People, there's a period of time in the history of church, there's still some churches that do this kind of thing. Not sure that they use St. Augustine where preachers who didn't feel that they themselves were very good speakers or very good exegetes, would read out sermons. And Augustine's were amongst those most prized in homiliaries, which are the books of homilies. So that's uh, one of the reasons why he's really important for the history of preaching, because he continues to be used as his actual sermons continue to be used as sermons um, for centuries after his death. But, so we sort of have these things, Augustine of City of God, Augustine the Preacher, and of course there's the Augustine of Confessions who creates this whole other kind of spiritual autobiography that not even Greg of Nazianzus does quite the same thing with, like no one is, it's a new kind of thing, and it becomes super that which sort of lies dormant for a while in terms of influence and then sort of bursts out again in the early modern era, influencing things like uh, St. Teresa of Avila and her autobiography and all these sorts of things. These things are going on, right? Um, and we also, of course, have Augustine the monastic. He's this um, highly influential on the monastic movement. He's an influence on St. Benedict of Nursia. He, uh, his own, his, the rule that he drafts is the foundational rule for the Dominicans, as well as, of course, anyone who is called an Augustinian would be following his rule, as, which includes most of the canons who are sort of priests who live in community in the city maybe technically not monks, for those who are about to get mad at me in the comments. <clears throat> so we have all of these, and of course, besides those, 
turning again, thinking about Augustine the preacher and Augustine the monastic, Augustine the teacher on prayer, sermons on the Lord's Prayer are amongst his repertoire. So he's not, he's there, he's waiting um, for you to find him. And uh, he shapes and molds the spirituality of the Western Church to an enormous degree in these ways. And he also does this once again through as Augustine the dogmatic theologian. Um, personally, I love his book De Trinitate. I'm not saying I also love the Cappadocians, so I also don't want anyone coming down hard on me for talking about how I like Saint Augustine as well. All right, you can like more than one thing, and like I just like the way he thinks through a lot of problems, whether you agree with him or not. That's another point of a YouTube video, at least not my kind of YouTube video. I'm here just to gush every once in a while, or to give you facts about stuff. So anyway, Augustine, the dogmatic theologian, who ultimately ends up becoming the like the main source for. Peter Lombard's sentences, um, if you look at book, volume, book one of the sentences, it's mostly just De Trinitate rearranged with sort of sort of problems being cropped up by Lombard that are then answered. So it's actually really cool um, to sort of see it that way, because Augustine is, I, as hopefully I've been showing, one of the single most important thinkers in all of Latin Christian thought. His influence isn't just in the Lombard, it's not just through the sermons and the homiliaries. It's not just the ongoing reading of City of God or Confessions. Or, um, the De Doctrina was used as a manual for theology, for preaching as well, right? These things are all going on, and you can see him, his influences on Anselm, who doesn't tend to cite his sources, unlike most medieval guys, which gets him in trouble from Lanfranc, so you know that Augustine's coming in. If you're thinking about Lanfranc's Eucharistic theology, which you should be, if you're not, get on that. You can see Augustine coming in there. Um, Robert Grosseteste does a lot of citations of Augustine as well, which actually, as it turns out, strangely enough, you can read the letters of Grosseteste in particular. Um, his quotations of Augustine seem actually not to have been come directly from Grosseteste's own reading of the sainted Bishop of Hippo, but in fact from Gratian's Decretum. So there, once again, another place, Canon Law, right? That's the primary main book as a textbook as well as source for canon law in the Western Latin Church from the mid 1100s onwards. And so here he's cropping up a 13th century with um, Gross test. As well, of course, if anyone knows the history of the Reformation and early Protestant thought, Luther, Calvin, the Augustinian, as well as, of course, the Catholic response is itself Augustine, people like Bellarmine and others. And so these are all things going on and the Book of Common Prayer is a richly Augustinian text. So if you think about chapters in the history of Christian spirituality, Augustine is huge. Um, so he's worth investing your time in. So if you missed out on City of God this fall, you could join me for Augustine the Preacher. And I do actually hope to continue teaching at least one St. Augustine course every year for the rest of my life. So, but really do take, take Augustine the Preacher. You'll learn a lot and it'll be lots of fun. Thanks for tuning in. See you again next time.